AEW Revolution, Sunday, pay-per-view, Greensboro Coliseum, Greensboro, North Carolina. The Mecca for Jim Crockett Promotions for many, many years. Last year's Revolution on March 5th was recently named the Wrestling Observer Newsletter's Show of the Year. AEW is coming off possibly its worst pay-per-view output of all time with World's End, which took place on December 30th. Although, Dave noted in the newsletter this week that the final World's End pay-per-view number was up 7.1% on television from Full Gear, so that would now indicate an estimate of about 141,000 buys The odds of AEW doing well on pay-per-view are always plus money, no matter the card, no matter the build, no matter anything. This show, I believe, will not only be no different, I believe it will do better. I don't have the record in front of me. I don't know if they will set a record for this show, but this show has got more than one match on it, but it might as well just be one for a lot of us olds out here. It is Sting's last match, teaming with Darby Allin to face the Young Bucks in a tornado tag for the AEW World Tag Team Championship. Over 16,000 tickets have been sold for this show. The atmosphere inside of there ought to be something else. On his podcast, Straight Talk with the Boss, that he does with Greg Gagne, Magnum TA announced he'll be in attendance for the show. Ric Flair will be there. Tony Schiavone will be there. Lex Luger will be there. Kevin Nash will not be there. I believe that's where the roll call stands right now. It's my hope that this will be akin to Ric Flair's WWE retirement way back in 2008, where... It is just a cavalcade of people and old stars from Ric Flair's past, uh, a past that I'm very familiar with. On December 12th, 1987, in Greensboro, Sting lost a match against Ric Flair for the NWA World Heavyweight title. That match took place about 14 months after Magnum TA uh, was involved in a tragic car accident, which ended his career and changed the trajectory of the NWA and possibly all of pro wrestling. You never know how the butterfly effect works, but the WWF still would have likely won the war. But we never saw a dominant babyface world champion in the NWA during that era to try to put up against Hulk Hogan. And Magnum was supposed to be that guy. In 1987, ended up being a very rough year creatively for Dusty Rhodes. But things began to turn around in 1988, And one of those reasons was because of Sting. On March 27th, 1988, he had the classic 45-minute match with Ric Flair on the Clash of the Champions, and the rest was history. One of the most iconic wrestlers in the history of WCW, in fact, the most iconic wrestler in the history of WCW, bar none. There is nobody else, whether you look at that era from 1988, late 88, early 89, after the Jim Crockett sold to Turner, or if you look at it from the actual renaming of the company from WCW in 1991, no matter how you cut it, no matter who you include, whether it's Ric Flair or Hulk Hogan or the NWO or anybody else, Sting is the person most associated with WCW, which for a long time worked against him when it came to his legacy Thankfully, for many of us who grew up with him, who had to hear that he wasn't a Hall of Famer, who had to hear about all of these things, that this guy wasn't at the level in our minds he was at. Thankfully, things have worked out the way they have, where he is placed on that pedestal. So many great memories for me from throughout Sting's career. One of my very first ones with him, probably the first one with him that really matters, was the Russian flag burial angle Uh, of Bill Watts by Eddie Gilbert in the UWF, where Gilbert and the Koloffs and Corsita Korchenko beat up Bill Watts and then laid him out after laying him out, placed the Russian flag, draped it over his prone body, got a lot of heat for that. That was in 1986. Sting and the future Ultimate Warrior as the Blade Runners were 
out on standby as the lookouts on the floor fighting with Steve Williams and Ted DiBiase and Hacksaw Duggan when they tried to come down and save Watts. From there, the team of Sting and Rick Steiner with Eddie Gilbert and Missy Hyatt was great. And I have said it a zillion times in 1989 when it was kind of a loose association with Eddie Gilbert, the Steiners, Missy, and Sting. That was one of my favorite groups ever, even though it was not like an official one in 1989. That was a hell of a team in the NWA. Sting and Flair, as I mentioned at the Clash of Champions, the 1989 feud with Sting and the Great Muda was incredible, you know, there to compliment Ric Flair and, and Terry Funk. Incredible stuff. Sting against the Dangerous Alliance. That gets passed over a lot because of the d decline that WCW was going into right before it really, really got low in 93, 94. At least in 1992, you had the Dangerous Alliance in there. That was always good stuff. Rick Rude against Sting. One of Vader's best opponents, Sting. You can't say, you cannot say that Sting wouldn't get in there. We see him fly around now and, and sacrifice his body in his 60s. That dude would be in there thumping and bumping with the best of them and never would stand down. You never heard about him complaining about somebody hitting him too hard or any of that sort of stuff just a, a hell of great matches with rude and vader right before he went full crow sting uh i believe aew listed this look earlier on this week as transition sting when he was letting the hair grow out a little bit he still had the surfer face paint but he kind of had the the hair was uh was turning more brown and going back to its natural color he had a, a a good little feud with william regal over the tv title that was very very entertaining just one of the again most iconic and enduring and honestly he's one of the last pro wrestling heroes that we have we have so many guys that work heel and obviously at the beginning of his career he worked heel and yeah there were some other times main event mafia or i don't know nwo Wolfpack. even though they were heels they were the popular heels and all that sort of stuff i guess technically he turned dirty but i think in the fans eyes as much of a schmuck as he would be trusting rick flair over and over again my God, the people loved Sting. And it's geeks like me that stood behind him after all these years. And really, one of the last heroic wrestling figures. We see Hangman Adam Page right now going dirty. I never really thought that would happen at the beginning of AEW. I thought he would actually kind of be there, John Wayne, forever. Although, he's never, never really worked heel before. Now would be a good time to do it when they're all cheering the guy that cut a promo over your baby. I guess it would be the time to turn heel. But Sting... Never really went back to it. And even when he did, people didn't care. They still loved that dude. So I hope, as I mentioned yesterday, it is Sting and Darby Allen who get the victory and they lay those belts down with the Young Bucks then being in a tournament and you can build towards FTR and the Young Bucks. Another thing that you could do, obviously, Young Bucks defeat under... Again, you could bring somebody in. You could have Adam Page if you're going to do an all-heel elite group because Omega's gone. You could do that. You could have Page come out at the end. You know, Virginia guy, this is a guy who grew up on Sting. He causes it. They all try to beat him down afterwards and, and ruin everything. FTR and whoever comes out makes the save. And then that takes you to FTR and to the Young Bucks because with the way that FTR is getting treated right now, I mean, they couldn't be any further down kind of on the uh, on the depth chart the way things are going so you know bring them back up again a lot of people don't think that they've seen the ultimate young bucks ftr match yet they don't believe they've seen the best feud between the two best teams in the company they don't think they've really really gotten that that great of a feud yet well i guess this could be another chance to do it and again if you're going to have the young bucks go out and beat sting and and go out and beat darby allen i'd like to see them get some comeuppance for it tonight and then have that continue on and give them some comeuppance as we go along three-way for the AEW world title samoa joe against hangman adam page swerve strickland I want to keep the title on Samoa Joe. I don't know what the prevailing feelings are out there about this match and what people believe. I know a lot of people want to see Swerve Strickland be the champion. I'm not against Swerve Strickland being the champion. I just think, I just don't think we're done with Paige and Swerve quite yet. And I think we need to have a situation because, again, Swerve cut the promo on Wednesday 
where I, I, I'm i so crazy. I, I beat up an 18-year-old at his house. I'm so crazy. I broke into another man's house and cut a promo over his baby. And Paige is just standing there like that. That too much dialogue. That should have been the point where he took the crutch and beat him over the head with it. You know, he's a justified healer. Listen to this guy. Listen to listen to him talk. They didn't decide to go ahead and do that, but I don't think that things are over for them yet. And I think that's okay because I'd like to see Samoa Joe continue on with that championship. International title, Orange Cassidy against Roderick Strong. I don't see a reason that Roderick Strong doesn't win this title. I don't know when MJF is going to come back. Obviously, Adam Cole is going to be out for quite some time. The Devil storyline was a complete wet burst of wind, I, I guess you could say, trying to be nice about it here and, and not violate any FCC rules over what I really thought about that whole situation and that whole feud, but... Cassidy's won the title twice. He's had a zillion matches. I don't think he needs the title. I think Roderick Strong right now could use that title a lot more. And frankly, for his image and what type of character that he's been playing, it's probably time now to, again, really make a hard turn for this dude to stop screaming in his promos and being kind of a putz and just going back to being maybe a little bit more of a wrestling machine, turning it down a little bit when it comes to, you know, trying to get across his personality and letting some of the wrestling do some of that talking and him with that international title with Bennett and Taven on the outside, always providing some assistance. I think it's probably time for that. I don't think it's a time for a title change when it comes to Tony Storm and Deanna Perrazzo. And I would say that it could have been if this feud was hotter. And unfortunately, it's not. And I like Deanna Perrazzo a lot. And I think if she had something hot going, you could have Perrazzo get a win over Storm here, banana peel or whatever, get the victory. And then you do something else with her as you wait for the inevitable. But since it didn't end up happening... I would just go ahead and wait for the inevitable, which is March 14th when Mercedes Monet debuts at Big Business in Boston. Tony Storm and Mercedes Monet seems to make the most sense on paper, especially because what you got going on with the other title when it comes to Willow and Chris Statlander and uh, uh, Julia Hart and uh, what's her name? Sky Blue. You know, the, that situation with that title is all tied up right now. So Tony Storm and Mercedes Monet, and we'll see how that goes. Because, <laughs> again, Tony Storm as a gimmick has been great. Tony Storm in execution when it comes to some of these matches as champion. And in this character, uh, kind of hasn't been. Continental Classic Championship. I see a title change here. Brian Danielson getting the win over Eddie Kingston. Kenoste Takeshita, I believe, gets the win over Will Ospreay. It's just a matter of how that ends up going down and how it happens. I think we still have a long way to go as far as Ospreay getting kicked out of the Cows family. TNT title, Christian Cage, I think, will defeat Daniel Garcia. And I believe the FTR, the FTR, I believe FTR is going to defeat Claudio and John Moxley. And I believe that Wardlow will walk out of the eight-man All-Star Scramble match as the victor. Hey guys, did you love this clip? If so, you should join our channel. Just hit the join button and you'll have full access to every single show that we do. Wrestling Observer Live, Wrestling Observer Radio, The Brian and Vinny Show, all of them in full HD, full length, plus archives of all of your favorite shows. Click join today and don't miss out.